Thanks for checking out this show review video. So this is for the 2012 show Holliston, and that's just when it started, was in 2012, and it got two seasons. It was actually supposed to have a third season, but it was hosted on Fearnet at the time, and Fearnet ended up going under, as we probably all know, and for that reason, the third season didn't happen, and they kind of looked for a little bit to try and get another home for it. Then it seems like it kind of petered out, and it just never happened. Now that said, reportedly, Adam Green, who was the main writer for this, uh, along with Joe Lynch, uh, it was said that Adam Green had actually planned out six seasons worth of, you know, core story for the film. Because each episode, kind of the way it's set up, is just uh, self-contained certain things going on. Like a typical comedy sitcom. Um, that's redundant to say comedy sitcom. But like a typical sitcom. But obviously this has a horror aspect to it. Uh, but it has, you know ongoing storylines for it as a lot of them do but each episode has something self-contained additionally or a few things self-contained actually so my thought is that he just had the kind of like underlying storylines that connect throughout planned out that far and not the individual episodes maybe a few individual episodes if season three had already been announced but yeah that's where they ended up so created by adam green who did such films as hatchet uh for all the Hatchet films, including Victor Crowley, Frozen, and Digging Up the Marrow, just to name a few that he did. Uh, so if you like that stuff, you probably like uh, you probably like Holliston because a lot of the humor that you get in the films from Adam Green are in Holliston and even bigger proportions. It's kind of blown up. It's a little more ridiculous because it is very sitcom-like. Uh, you know, sitcoms always have that kind of over-the-top, overblown situations, overblown reactions, language, all that stuff. And it's definitely here in the Holliston film, so, or Holliston show. So it definitely feels like it is a sitcom, just with a bunch of horror injected into it. And it's fun. I'll say I think it's a fun show, and I would recommend it to people. When I'm doing this review and when I watched it, it was available on the Shutter streaming service, so... It's been there for a bit, so I think it's probably going to stay for a while. So check it out. I do recommend it. D. Snyder uh, was in this. Is in this uh, the kind of weird, really weird characters who are re reoccurring characters? D. Snyder's in it as Lance Rocket and Odorous Arungus, um, who's actually Dave Brocky, who plays Odorous Arungus from the band Guar. He's in this and he plays himself. He is Odorous Arungus who is a character in Guar and in the show, basically. Uh, and he just ends up playing one of the characters, like the inside of their head, kind of like his his person he talks to when he's talking to himself, trying to figure situations out. And it works well. I do like it. So D. Snyder is in this, and he ended up doing his own musical movements and vocalizations, kind of improv during it, because he does this thing where he'll show up, and then when he's going to leave, he starts like yelling all these things to music. Like he's a rock star, kind of like closing down a rock show. Um, and it was interesting to find out that he kind of improv a lot of that, his own movements, what he was yelling out, how he was singing it. And then after the fact, the person who did their music would actually create music to sync up with his movements. And that's kind of one of my favorite parts. Actually, my favorite parts of the show in general are when Lance Rocket's on there, D. Snyder. He did a great job with that character, and it's very D. Snyder. Uh, and Odorous Arungus is another really fun one because Dave Brocky just brought so much comedy and interesting aspects to that character, which is a character he's been playing for a long time, obviously. Unfortunately, Dave Brocky's no longer alive. He passed away some years ago, so it's kind of sad to watch it and see him and be like, oh, he's not with us anymore. So the composer was actually Bear McCreary, who's done a lot of film, a lot of scores for films. Uh, he's the one who was creating the music afterwards. So apparently the show was based on Adam Green's life growing up in Holliston, Massachusetts, which is where the name, obviously, for the show comes from. Uh, this kind of based off the very first film he did, which was called Coffee and Donuts. So you can tell that a lot of this stuff seems kind of personal from a life experience aspect. And it is, obviously, for, for Adam Green. But obviously blown way more out of proportion, made way more funny, all that jazz. Most of the crew for the show also worked on a lot of Adam Green's films. 
So he kind of got a core of people, well, has over time, and he, he uses these people over and over, which is good. Kind of shows you that people like working with him, which is a good sign. As jokes, uh, Green and uh, Adam Green and Joe Lynch actually had portions where they would actually hit each other, like their characters were supposed to hit each other, but they would actually be hitting each other. So the makeup department ended up having to tell them that they needed to stop that because they were starting to leave actual bruises and welts that they would have to then cover up with makeup. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. But the whole premise of the show really is just two guys, super broke, working at a local public access television channel, uh, trying to make a horror movie on the side on their, during their own time with no money, and then they have other people in their lives who are characters, and they themselves are, you know, real characters, and it's just about all the zany hijinks that they get up to. So, it, there's a lot of relatable stuff life-wise, there's also some, some good relatable stuff horror community-wise, it's fun. It plays like an old-school sitcom complete with laugh track. Now, that's one thing I don't like, but it's something that you start to get used to it because a lot of shows have gone away from doing the laugh tracks, which I'm glad about because I think it's a bad thing. But if you get used to it, it really doesn't take a whole lot to get used to it. So it's not that big of a deal, but the laugh track bothered me at first. I do think the acting of Green and Lynch is kind of rough. It's, it's that very kind of exaggerated stage acting type acting. I will say, I feel like it, it gets better as the season one goes on and into season two. So I think everyone in general acting wise, that was the case. You know, everyone's acting is much better by the end of season two than it was in the beginning of season one. So it's just something that you have to get used to. If you are feeling like the acting's not that great in the beginning, don't worry, it does get better gradually, just kind of improves and improves. The inclusion of Odorous Arungus is very much out of left field, but did a solid job with it. Like I said, Dave Brocky did a really good job. There are obviously a lot of horror film references and even just like small ones about just bringing up the title of, of a horror film or a series or having a debate about certain horror films or trying to figure out, oh, what am I going to watch tonight and talking about their film collection, things like that. So you'll like it if you're into horror. The sets really do feel like they're fake. You know, they do feel like a show set. One of the biggest reasons being there's so much extra space within the rooms that they're shooting. And you know what I you know what I'm saying like a lot of those sitcoms when they set up apartment rooms or bedrooms or whatever it is, it feels like there's way more space than there actually would be and things are too spaced out to to allow for the movement of the characters, but it make, gives it that kind of fake feel. And a lot of kind of like the set design is a little bit fakey as well. But it goes along with the sitcom feel. And to that, there are actually a bunch of points where Adam Green worked into the script breaking the fourth wall and letting you know that it's actually a show from time to time, including one shot at one point where they're showing the crew from behind the crew filming and on the set what was going on. They actually included like some flubs from the show in an episode of the show, which was kind of a very interesting thing to do with that breaking of the fourth wall. But those things don't happen all the time. It's just like here and there's a, there's a breaking of the fourth wall, which is kind of this funny nod to actual uh, trials and tribulations of making the show itself and kind of a funny nod to the audience of, yes, we know what we're doing here and we're going to make fun of what we're doing here. There are there are portions of this uh, portions of scenes just early on really where the lighting is overly harsh. Uh, I think it was mainly one episode in the first season. I can't remember which episode it was. It was very early on, so obviously they got that issue figured out at some point, and it didn't bother me after that. But that's one of the things. Like it's kind of rough when you start out with the first few episodes. But trust me, it really kind of set, settles into a groove. And by the time you get to the end of season two, you're kind of like, I really wish there was a season three. And who knows, you know, maybe they can go back to this at some point. Uh, Joe Lynch and Adam Green are, but I don't know. They might be too busy with their careers at this point. 
Uh, I love the music. The music is a lot of fun. It's it's very kind of like metal rock type mix of music. And if you like that type of stuff, you will enjoy that. Their theme song is particularly fun as well. There is an episode about a horror convention that has so much relatable stuff in it. If you're into the horror community, if you've been to horror conventions, there's a lot of relatable stuff in there, and I really like that about it. Those, those types of things that speak directly to the nerdy horror community. I love that stuff. There is some bad CGI in this, but it fits with being a sitcom. That's one of the things. Like The things that don't look the best or feel the best or come off the best just don't feel like they matter that much. Like it doesn't feel like it impacts it in a neg negative way because of the tone and how sitcom -y it is and the fact that they keep breaking the fourth wall with all these kind of nods of like, yeah, we know what's going on. So you just feel more lax about those things. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I don't, I don't know. So season one ended up having six episodes that were around 40 minutes apiece, and season two had 11 episodes at 22 minutes, except the first episode of that season being 50 minutes. So it was interesting to see that they kind of lengthened the amount of episodes, but cut down the runtime of the, the, the episodes. Um, I think I preferred it more when it was shorter in season two, as, as opposed to season one, because it makes it easier to kind of cut it up and be like, oh, I'll just do like one episode here, or two episodes here as opposed to watching one episode and getting less episodes and feeling like you have to, you know, complete that one episode. So you're kind of burning through it a lot faster in a sense. So I just feel like the way they made that change for season two really helped you to kind of feel like you were savoring the episodes a little bit more, which was nice. My favorite people. I already told you Dee Snyder in this, Dave Brocky in this, and also Laura Ortiz, her character, she did an excellent job with. Very funny, very interesting, very unique character who I really loved in this. I like everyone in it, but just Dave Brocky, D. Snyder, and Laura Ortiz were my favorite by far. Like, they were much above. So, there were a few cameos that they ended up having in this, like some big-name cameos. Um, I'll say that at the very end. I'll kind of give you a warning after I'm done talking about everything else. Um, if people don't want to know if they want to watch the show without knowing what cameos are going to be in there. So I'll prompt you on that one. But overall, obviously, I really enjoyed the show. If you haven't seen it, I really would recommend to see it. It's on Shudder. Um, you'll go through it pretty quick. I really do feel like you will. But, you know, you may not love it as much as I do. Go ahead and put your comments down here. Let me know what you think about it. Love it, hate it. We can talk about it. Uh, overall, I would give it a so very solid three and a half out of five stars. Enjoy it, yeah. So put me some comments down there, let me know. Also, hit that subscribe button if you aren't already. If you already are, thank you very much. I do appreciate that so much. Uh, if you're not, literally takes you a second, totally painless, costs you nothing, and it helps mo keep me motivated, legitimately keeps me motivated. Whenever I see a new person subscribing, I really kind of feel like I get a boost of energy to keep doing this stuff. So really appreciate it. Also hit the notification bell button because then you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos. And if you watch them early on, that kind of helps them build traction and can help with views and, you know, all that jazz. But anyway, thank you very much for that. And now I'm going to tell you what the big cameos for the show are. So if you don't want to know it, stop watching now. Bill Mosley, Ray Wise, Derek Mears, Brian Pesain, Tony Todd, Seth Green, Danielle Harris, John Landis, Kane Hodder, James Gunn, Sid Haig, and Darren Lynn Bowsman. Pretty good. Pretty good for cameos. And it's fun the way they get integrated. So, uh, like I said, I had a fun time. Let me know your comments. All that jazz. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, keep it brutal.